We're back. We're live. It's one o'clock rock here on a given Tuesday. Life in the law with David Foreman on the World Conservation Congress, which is so big. I can't believe it. It's getting bigger every time you look. David Foreman is director of the environmental law program at the William S. Richardson School of Law, UH Manoa. And he joins us today to talk about emerging leaders and the future of environmental law, not only here in Hawaii, Nei, but everywhere. That's right. Hi, David. Thank Hi. you for coming down. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. <laughs> So what's going on at the William S. Richardson School of Law in terms of environmental law? Very exciting. Oh, so much to talk about. Uh, the program is doing wonderfully. We've, we're putting out terrific students, uh, finding wonderful placements for them out in the community. Uh, we've, we've got all kinds of uh, capacity that's being built. But the IUCN coming here in September uh, is a, week a, away. a historic <laughs> event. Just a week away. So a lot of preparations that are, 10, that are going on. people. Well, we're hoping there were some issues with uh, visa uh, uh, permissions, uh, approvals. Ooh. And so we may have a little less than we anticipated, but still a very significant uh, Congress. And actually, some have said the most significant uh, conservation conference in the United States since Teddy Roosevelt's 1908 <laughs> White House Conference on <laughs> Conservation. So very significant wow. event. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it's going to be huge, but it reflects something. You know, it's just, it didn't happen all by itself. It, it's on a continuum of some kind. And I wanted to ask you to describe that continuum and the way people have gotten, the world has gotten interested uh, in this issue. And of course, COP21 a few months ago right. is part of that continuum. So where are we uh, on, the, on the way to really doing things in environmental law? Yeah, so we've come a long way from the origins of creating national parks, which Teddy Roosevelt was involved in, and then post-World War II, the creation, uh, the, you know, there was interest in uh, addressing the impacts of the war, and, and uh, conservation was one of those issues. And so since that point, uh, we've gotten more and more involvement uh, at the conservation level and getting lawyers actually involved more actively. Uh, the law school joined the IUCN, uh, we had been thinking about it before they actually came to Hawaii, but when they made the decision to come to Hawaii instead of Turkey, <laughs> yeah, we I thought, you know, absolutely, we've absolutely, got to get this yeah. done. And yeah. some of our partners had been er, encouraging us, and that was the little shove that we needed to, to get involved both as voting members of the IECN, so the environmental law program. Our head of delegation will be Denise Antolini, my predecessor. Uh, we've got faculty members that participate individually as members of the World Commission on Environmental Law. That's one of six commissions in the IUCN. And then we're also an institutional member. The law school itself is an institutional member of the Academy of Environmental Law. And we're doing all kinds of wonderful things uh, to try to train folks. We're kind of combining, for example, the new development of the environmental court in Hawaii. And we've been, we've had uh, visitors from India and Brazil and other uh, parts of the world. We've met them yeah, right here at this table. I, I appreciate you for bringing them here and letting the public know about it. Uh, but we've been working with those folks. And so there were going to be uh, initiatives um, discussed at this Congress uh, involving the Environmental Court. For example, uh, the formation of a global judicial institute for the environment, a training center for judges. Uh, one of the issues we've dealt with here is what's your enforcement capacity? How are you training the prosecutors and the judges to deal with these uh, offenses? And uh, the passage of the recent law, the governor signed, I think the first bill the governor signed at the law school, allowing for alternative sentencing. So rather than finding somebody, maybe community education is the better uh, approach or uh, community service is the better approach than imposing a fine or jail time. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it, it strikes me that <clears throat> um, when, we, when we had COP21, we were talking about making an agreement between nation states, mm -hmm. hopefully to be ratified by whatever legislators, legislatures were in those nation states, including Congress. Right. Uh, and um, in, in that way, to achieve um, a global law, right. global law. Um, you're coming at it here at IUCN. You're coming at it from a slightly different perspective. You're coming at it from the legal side. Right. Uh, and maybe from the scientific side, which is actually a better side, I think. Um, but getting to the same place. Um, because if you can achieve changes in laws in various nation states, that actually has a more on-the-ground result, don't you think? Right, I think, and one of the projects I'm most heavily involved in for the IUCN comes out of this frustration with the COP process. You know, long, 20 years, uh, the f kind of perceived failure of the Kyoto Protocol, some successes with the Montreal Protocol to the 
uh, UN Framework the Convention. COP21 means the 21st right, time right. they have met. Exactly. And really, you know, we haven't heard much about it. Yeah, Sorry. and people were, what we got out of it was these uh, INDCs, these nationally determined uh, contributions that aren't binding necessarily. Although I've read some interesting analysis about the creativity that our, our president applied in that process in order to avoid the pitfalls of having to get Senate uh, ratification of an agreement, uh, phrase the agreement in a way that the executive action can accomplish. And, and it basically fits in with laws that have already been adopted by Congress, uh, Clean Air Act, for example. So we can do administrative rules and other commitments that don't require the agreement of the Senate. But still, people are frustrated and, and don't feel like uh, uh, our nations have gone far enough and that they need a little bit more push, you know, that it's not just voluntary, that it should be mandatory. And so uh, one of my good friends, Tony Oposa, who I believe has been well, on the show as well. right here in this, uh, in this room. So when he was here visiting as um, uh, Dan and Maggie Inouye, Distinguished Chair of Democratic Ideals, uh, he had reflected that frustration he represents in Micronesia uh, uh, in the COP discussions. And, and he wanted to do something else. He wanted something uh, action forcing. And he thought, OK, well, there was this effort, the Palau Initiative, to try to get liability for harm resulting from climate change. But that meant a lot of resistance. Developed countries, United States and others, didn't want to be held accountable for, for that harm. So the idea was, well, let's look forward. What's, what is the responsibility under international law of states, nations, to address the effects of the cl global climate crisis on present and future generations? So rather than looking backward, looking forward, and so we can go to the International Court of Justice and ask them to issue an advisory opinion. What is the status of the law? What are nations' requirements under the Framework Convention, under the Law of the Sea, and perhaps maybe more significantly under the adoption of the Sustainable Development Goals by the, by the United Nations? What I get is that international law is a, a, you know, they say the law is a jealous mistress. International law is an elusive mistress. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes you can do it and sometimes you can't. Sometimes you think you have an international agreement, but you don't. Right. Um, and it takes, a, it takes a village. It takes the whole world to sort of buy into this. And I, the reality is it's little by little. Uh, right. You know, you got to get people, countries to come along on it. And the way IUC is doing it, I think, is very positive mm -hmm. because it's grassroots almost. And if you have a lot of people in the legal establishments of those countries, in the environmental activist establishments of those countries, it will bubble up to the top. It will become uh, a demand made on right. the governments of those right. countries. Right. And I think that's what's happening, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I think so, for sure. And the IUCN has had some tremendous successes. The Convention on the International Trade of Endangered Species, the Ramsar Convention, which protects wetlands, those all originated from the IUCN. And so the hope is that we can uh, show, it's basically a proof of concept, right, that this could actually work. We could get, and, and we're going to show people what it would look like. We've had students from around the world uh, write memorials, written uh, submissions or briefs uh, on, representing regional intergovernmental organizations. It would have been too much to try to represent all the countries in the world, um, and we may have hit some of the obstacles that you discussed earlier. <laughs> but uh, we, we decided we would uh, let we represent intergovernmental organizations. So we have uh, six teams coming in for this moot court workshop. Sounds like we got to talk about that in detail. I sure, it's fabulous. Yeah, you want to? Shall we do it now or? Uh, I want to see your pictures now. Okay. Show okay. and tell. We have some right. pictures, and, uh, and, and here they are. Can you describe oh, okay. what we're seeing? What is sure. That? So there are many components to the law school's involvement in the IUCN, and one of those is our effort to meet the needs uh, of, of folks who uh, are not going to be paying the large amount that is required to register uh, for the convention. And so we're, what we're doing is we're bringing the IUCN to the law school, right? So we're calling that IUCN at UH Law. Has it occurred to you there's going to be a huge crowd at the law school? That <laughs> we hope so. We hope so. We would would really enjoy people to come. Our first speaker is going to be the evening of Tuesday, August 30th. So before the convention starts. This is the deputy chair of the World Commission on Environmental Great. Law. And so he'll be talking about the sustainable development goals that I mentioned and the rule of law. You know, it, precisely the question that you, you had raised. So it's a, a nice segue. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so he will be here. We'll also have 
uh, what was billed as a knowledge cafe for the con uh, convention center, but the group that's running it, our partners at uh, Halb uh, School of Law at Pace University in New mm -hmm, York, mm -hmm. uh, they were they wanted to have something that uh, had more interaction with the public than the knowledge cafe, which was isolated to subject matter interests uh, among another uh, 15 groups of folks. And so we're going to have a, an energy, um, a renewable energy focused uh, forum, and that'll take place uh, September 5th at the law school. So on Labor Day, uh, for those that aren't attending our moot court workshop, uh, that's 8.30 to 10.30 in the morning. You could make it to the law school after that. <laughs> I think you'll have a crowd on that one, too. Energy is so big and getting bigger. Mm -hmm. For sure. It's important to the future policy of the state. So what's this now? Okay, so this is the, uh, the moot court workshop. So we were one of the uh, lucky few that uh, were accepted for a workshop out of a record 1,500 uh, applications. And so these are the partners uh, represented on the bottom of the screen. These are the schools that I was uh, referring to. So in our, our law school students will be representing the Alliance of Small Island States. Uh, we will have the Pace Law School at Haub in uh, New York. They're representing the Arab League. Uh, then we'll have a law school from Brazil. That's the Milton Campos Law School. They're representing the Organization of American States. Uh, the University of Cebu. Uh, from the Philippines, they'll be representing ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Seoul National University in South Korea, they will be representing the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And we've had a, a, a recent entry. We will also have uh, somebody from Sciences Po Rennes in France uh, representing the European Parliament. So, and this, this woman has done a, um, young lady has uh, started a crowdsourcing campaign, and so uh, I'm going to try to get information out there to help bring her from France all the way to Hawaii. Wonderful. Yes. Got to meet these people. <laughs> What's this now? Okay, so this is, uh, this is accessible to the public. Uh, this is our workshop, the Intergenerational Climate Justice Workshop. Mm -hmm. uh, it's workshop 9695 uh, if you're trying to search for it through the IUCN system. But you can see on the left side of the screen documents, these are the memorials or the written submissions that the students have submitted. And so we designed it, rather than a moot court competition, we designed it as a collaborative uh, presentational kind of uh, proof of concept. And so the students submitted drafts and we, uh, we got experts from around the world, subject matter experts, to give feedback and then to help the students revise. And so the students looked at that, um, that those suggestions and now have the finished product posted. And we're going to both have the written materials, which folks can use in the future, whether it's nations wanting to make arguments or other students from other schools that want to have a moot court of their own and address regional issues that we didn't talk about. Uh, and we'll also record the session. We'll have a moot court session at the Hawaii Supreme Court on September 1st, uh, 1.30 to 3.30. At the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we've been re really grateful to Chief Justice Mark Rechtenwald for uh, allowing us the use of the court. And not only that, he will be the acting president of the International Court of Justice <laughs> for this session. Perfect. Yeah. Maybe he has aspirations. Well, I don't know. He's, <laughs> he's certainly got the temperament for it. <laughs> yes, he does. And he'll be joined by some subject matter experts. My colleague, uh, Professor Maxine Burkett, will have uh, Professor Christina Voigt from the University of Oslo in Norway, uh, Professor Emily Gaillard from uh, Sciences Po Rennes in France, as well as um, I'm drawing a blank right now. If it was, I, I know who it is. Um, we come back. Yeah, okay. Let's take a short break, as a matter of fact, and we'll come back and learn more about the moot court, which really interests me. Uh, if you don't know about moot courts, you're going to know more about moot courts in one minute. You'll see. Hey, everybody. My name is David Chang, and I am a new host for the show, The Art of Thinking Smart. I'm really excited to be able to share with you how to get the smart edge in life. We're going to have awesome guests in the military, business, political, nonprofit world. So no matter what background you're from, we have something for you. Please join us every other Thursday at 10 a.m. at thinktechhawaii.com or on theartofthinkingsmart.com. I look forward to seeing you. Aloha, I'm Kirsten Baumgart-Turner, host of Sustainable Hawaii. Thanks for watching Think Tech this summer. We have a lot of terrific shows of great importance, and I hope you'll watch my show too every Tuesday at noon as we address sustainability issues for Hawaii. They're really pertinent as the World Conservation Congress approaches in September, and the World Youth Congress that's focusing on sustainability next year as well. 
Have a great summer and tune in at noon every Tuesday. Bingo, we're back. One o'clock rock, Life in the Law with David Foreman, uh, Director of Environmental Law Program at William S. Richardson School of Law, UH Manoa. We are so happy to have him here talking about emerging leaders and the future of environmental law here in Hawaii and elsewhere, especially in, in this incredible conference, biggest ever conference, coming to the convention center, what, next week? That's right, September so. 1st to September 10th. They have a bunch of pre-Congress activities and post-Congress activities, but the, the meat of it will take place, uh, a forum, all of these workshops and, and events, uh, September 1 to September 5, and then September 6 to September 10 will be the uh, assembly when we'll uh, do the business of the, of the Congress, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Yeah. But I wanted to make sure that I added in the name of our Russian judge, uh, uh, Professor Irina Krasnova, will be al also on the panel on September 1st at the Hawaii Supreme Court. Excellent, excellent. Okay, let's talk about moot courts for a minute. I mean, because, you know, to continue on the continuum, you know, you want to raise public awareness about the law, the environmental law, in the thought that um, if, you, if you can do that, then people become aware that you can protect the environment through the law. You just got to make good laws, and you got to make them everywhere in the world to protect the planet. This is not easy, but this is, in my view, the way you do it. So uh, it's a conversation. It's a conversation leading to um, judges that know more, uh, legislatures that know more. Uh, and ultimately countries that know more. And it's coming up through the legal community, which is just great. It makes the legal community more relevant than ever before, and presumably more likable than ever before. How about <laughs> hopefully, that? Hopefully. It's a new idea. Well, well, I think, you know, like a lot of legislation, you, you can write the, you, you craft the law, and, but then there are debates about what that law actually means. Yeah. Right? And so there are lots of issues, uh, international laws, uh, treaties, conventions, uh, other uh, customary international law, et cetera, those obligations that are binding on the international community, but people will argue about, well, what does it really mean? I mean, we, you, you had Diane Desierto here talking about the uh, uh, issues in the South China Sea. Uh, so there are debates between countries about that issue. So that's what we've set up. So in this moot court, uh, rather than address all of the panoply of environmental laws that might bear on the question of, of the climate crisis, uh, we have focused in on the sustainable development goals that the United Nations adopted at the end of 2015, uh, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is an obvious uh, element, uh, but also the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. So those are the three main uh, substantive areas uh, that the students will be focused on. Who would have expected that the University of Hawaii School of Law, the William S. Richardson School of Law, would be a global player? an international player. That's what has happened here. Well, Over the last few years, mm -hmm. uh, the school has emerged to be a, a, a global magnet for issues like this and a great arbiter in international thinking. How about that? It's fantastic. We really do have a tremendous faculty. I mean, if you look at the number of faculty members at our law school that focus on uh, international issues, it's and compare that to, in terms of faculty-student ratio, it's got to be the best in the country. It's really fantastic. It was one of the reasons that I decided to go to this law school. I mean, at the time, we had the Law of the Sea Institute here, right? So we're talking John about... John Van Dyke. Right, John that. Van Dyke and John Craven and... Um, uh, that group uh, really did a, a tremendous amount of work. Um, Sherry Broder is continuing that work. Uh, she was here yesterday. Yes, she is. Uh, we're really grateful for the amount of time that she contributes to the law school teaching our international CU's classes. Uh, but so I think that this is something that we can build upon. You know, we've got three key programs at the core programs at the law school. The environmental law program is one. The Kuhuliao Center for Excellence in Native Hawaiian Law is another, and we've got a very strong synergy between those two programs. But I've been pitching that we should have an equally strong synergy between our environmental law program and our Pacific Asian Legal Studies program. And so, and particularly, you know, build upon our expertise in China, Japan, and Korea, but also look to Southeast Asia and the Pacific. You know, I think that's some, a way that we can really stand out uh, compared to a lot of the other universities that already have uh, programs in, in, in the, the three bigger countries in that area. We're perfectly situated. Absolutely. And it's the perfect time for us. So what does intergenerational mean in this context? Right. And so the idea is looking, uh, basically it's, in some contexts people would say it's the public trust doctrine, basically. basically. You know, like what are your obligations to the generations that are come forward? Uh, if you thought about it in indigenous terms, it's making decisions 
based on seven generations, right? Mm -hmm. Looking forward rather than taking, uh, making your decisions in the short, on short term, thinking about it in the long term. And so this builds upon some work that Tony Oposa did. Uh, there's a famous case, a Miners Oposa versus Factoron back in 1993, the Philippine Supreme Court recognized the ability of uh, folks to bring claims on behalf of future generations in order to stop the logging that was taking place in the Philippines. What a that, wonderful notion. Yeah, they were, they were going to be out of their for, rainforests if yeah. they hadn't, have ta hadn't taken action. So, so often we don't do that. We, we look only at this term of office, this political cycle. Right. You have to do that now. Right. And so we, we thought, what better idea to talk about these, inner, these issues then have the voices of future generations present those arguments, right? So we've got some of the top law students from around the country. So that's when you say represent. Right. These law students, lawyers, whoever is speaking, they are speaking on behalf of future generations on these issues. Right, and we thought uh, not only having those students uh, just for the for their own presence, but the impact on our own students to be interacting with their peers around the around the world, we yeah, thought would be yeah. a fantastic That's opportunity. That's why videotaping mm. is so important, right. putting it out there. Right. And so, in addition to the memorials that we showed you, we showed earlier, uh, we're going to post uh, recordings of the of the arguments as well. And we're hoping that people will look to it and and uh, simulate uh, their own uh, efforts. And so that way, we would build consensus uh, and support for. Uh, activating, action-forcing norms, basically, that the Uni United Nations Framework Convention has some teeth to it, right? And so that's what we're hoping to accomplish. So I'm one of the speakers mm -hmm. uh, in, in the uh, moot court. What a wonderful way to connect it up with the general study of law, to call it a moot court. And I am going to represent uh, the future generations in my area, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to make arguments on their behalf. Right. Um, and my arguments are not going to be the same, perhaps, as uh, somebody representing another area and future generations in that area. Give me an example. I mean, I, I know you don't know exactly what they're going to say, but yeah. what, what might they argue from a given area? Pick an well, area. So, so somebody might say, uh, look to a particular document. You know, there's the Sustainable Development Goals now has a, a, a provision that, that looks at energy, renewable energy, for example. And so, but it's a, it, it's not a complex, uh, complex, wordly worded document. And so one side might say, well, renewable energy for developing nations means one thing, and, but for a developed country, it means another, right? And so the re uh, folks from the developing side might say, well, you know, the, the developed nations have an obligation to provide support for us, right? And that developed nations might be arguing, well, you know, that we're, we're going to continue doing what we're doing because it's the, the best use of our, the highest and best use of our resources. And where the developing nations might say that, well, you've got to take into consideration that what you're doing is impacting us and the availability of those resources for the future. So there are resources all around the world, some of which are tied to national jurisdictions and some that are part of what you might refer to as the common heritage of mankind. And so there are competing interests about how best to use those resources. Should they go to those who have developed the um, technological and uh, capacity to exploit those resources? Or should the benefits of that uh, also be shared with uh, nations that don't have that technological capacity? Wow. So they, the students who make these arguments can find policy issues everywhere. Right and dwell on however many they wish. I mean, how much time do they have to present their case? Well, we're only, we gotta, we've, we've got a limited amount of time. They, they could go in, on for a long time. We've tried to narrow it down. So we've asked them to prepare 10 minutes, and they may get interrupted by the judges, and uh, Chief Justice Rechtenwald, as the president of the court, will have the discretion <laughs> to extend their time. And so we've built that into the program, uh, and we're hoping to get some exchange, and both, um, the way the moot court is set up later, the one that's going to take place on September 5th at the Hawaii Convention Center, we're going to show an edited version of that um, moot court that takes place at the Hawaii Supreme Court. And then we're going to have the students come on and, and share their perspective. So they may touch on issues that weren't in the, on the video. We'll look at it with them uh, the day before. I, I, I pray. Right. So it's just a looking back retrospective about what was right. discussed. Yeah, and then you know their experiences with it. Then we'll have the panel jur envir international environmental jurists react. Uh, you know their perspective on that. that issue, yeah. and then we'll open it up. We'll have a facilitated dialogue with the other attendees at the at the Congress. So it'll be an active, uh, interactive workshop, and so maybe individuals whose regions weren't represented might, might want to. Uh, 
uh, talk about some of those issues and get some reactions from the, either the judges or the, or the students. Very interesting, very provocative. And it actually, there's one more step to it, yeah, too. More. <laughs> yeah, and this might lead us into the, um, uh, the motions, but there is a parallel motion that has been submitted for vote. Uh, we, they're counting the votes right now, so we don't know whether it's passed or not. But our partners at PACE in, in New York has submitted a motion that asks the IUCN Assembly to encourage the United Nations General Assembly to ask the International Court of Justice for an advisory opinion on the Sustainable Development Goals, which includes climate change. And so uh, we'll use this as an opportunity to say, hey, look, this is the goal. Uh, if it passes, then we need to do a lobbying campaign to get nations within the General Assembly to vote for that request, and then it will go to the uh, International Court of Justice. So, you know, inherent in that process is that they will be bound right. by, by asking for the vote right. and by the United Nations asking for the vote. So, in, in a phrase, though, what, what will the, what will the uh, International Court be asked to rule on? Yeah, so the, that's part of the debate, right? Uh, uh, Tony Opposa really wants it to be focused on the climate crisis. Uh, there are uh, others that feel that uh, this is better phrased as one of the sustainable development goals. It was most recently adopted by the United Nations uh, General Assembly, and so that would be the more strategic way uh, of addressing the question. But the question that, um, that we are posing in our moot court workshop is what is the responsibility of states under international law to address the effects of the uh, climate crisis on present and future generations. That's a hard one. Yeah. That's the yeah. elusive part. Yeah. And so, but the, you know, similarly uh, difficult questions have been asked of the ICJ before. One of the very first uh, in international environmental law decisions was actually the nuclear weapons advisory opinion. You know, so talking about the impacts of using nuclear weapons on the environment. And so there was some very strong language that came out of that decision, also some language that made some people uncomfortable because the court wasn't uh, prepared to, sit, to rule out the possibility of u using nuclear weapons in, in a defensive or as a deterrent. So, yeah, yeah. Well, this is really cutting edge, isn't it? Because, I mean, from where this is going, it could have a huge effect, maybe even a greater effect at the end of the day than COP21 had because um, it hasn't been ratified. Right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, well, the thing I wanted to ask you is, so when this is over, and it'll be an extended uh, convention, right. Congress uh, next week and into mm -hmm. the week after, um, what happens then? Is that it? All finished? No. Uh, or, or is the William S. Richardson School of Law, your program, have some other plans following all of that? No, absolutely. We're going to be building on that. We're hoping that this initiative with the Moot Court um, takes on a life of its own, is embraced by, by their folks, will we'll be involved with uh, IUCN on an ongoing basis. Uh, we will be involved with the World Commission on Environmental Law and their Global Judicial Institute for the Environment, we'll be providing training. Uh, you've talked with some of the folks from India and uh, Brazil about uh, our environmental court being a model for the rest of the world. And so uh, we're going we're gonna to work on that. There are some enforcement issues that we're exploring. Maybe we can provide some training for uh, prosecutors and judges in other parts of the Southeast Asia and the Pacific Islands, for example. Uh, lots of opportunities for our students to get involved in these issues. From we, wherever they come. Right. And we even have uh, one of the first things that uh, my, one of my first acts as, uh, when I got to the environmental law program was authorizing a travel grant for one of our students to attend the IUCN Congress in, in Jeju. And she's now doing work as an ocean policy consultant while she's getting her PhD at the University of Australia. But she's been involved in discussions at the United Nations, their prep preparatory committee meetings to flesh out uh, the governance structure for marine areas beyond national jurisdiction. So how do these common uh, resources, how do, how do we deal with bioprospecting and those kinds of questions. And so we've got some of our graduates that are working on some of these really compelling issues. Never stop, David. No. Never stop. Um, last question, and you're going to look at camera okay. one and uh, talk to the people and tell them why they should care about all this. What does it mean to the man and the woman on the street? Well, I think that the ability to use the rule of law uh, to affect your conservation goals is, is something that uh, it holds a lot of promise for the future. And uh, we're looking at uh, the students that we are teaching uh, to provide those uh, voices, and we're looking to them to cooperate with others around the world. 
uh, sometimes you get excellent ideas from, from people that are facing different situations. And so having this opportunity to interact with conservation leaders and international environmental lawyers from all over the world is a, a valuable experience, not only for our students, but for the community at large. Thank you, David Foreman, uh, Director of the Environmental Law Program at William S. Richardson School of Law, US University of Hawaii. By the way, Think Tech cares deeply about this. We've had a number of, of the names in this area of, of legal thought on the show here, and we are covering the World Conservation Congress next week like a blanket. Right. We have Anu Hiddle going down there, Kirsten Turner, and uh, Cowie Lucas. All three of them are going to be covering it. You will see more here on Think Tech about the WCC. Thanks so much, David. My pleasure, Jay. Thanks for having me.